Hello, everybody. Thank you so much uh, for being here today. And um, thanks for giving us patience as we uh, made sure we had a critical mass to get started. But we're going to go ahead and um, kick this off. I'm Christina Killingsworth. I'm Deputy Assistant Secretary of Commerce, and I have the privilege of overseeing EDA's national programs, including the Tech Hubs program. We are excited to brief you on the latest update of the Tech Hubs program. Since EDA designated 31 Tech Hubs last fall, the hubs submitted their applications um, in February worth over $2 billion. Many of you on the line um, were a part of that process, and we're incredibly grateful for the um, huge amount of work and effort you put into it, and we were thrilled by the applications that we received. We then entered into a rigorous evaluation process to allocate just over $500 million in implementation grants. On July 2nd, we announced what we hope is the first round of implementation grants to 12 of the 31 hubs. These 12 hubs represent the breadth and promise of the Tech Hubs program through advancements in sectors like quantum, biomanufacturing, autonomy, critical minerals, clean technology, semiconductors, and material manufacturing. These hubs will advance economic and national security, grow their regional economies, <clears throat> and advance the commercialization of critical technologies. But these were extremely difficult choices. All 31 hubs were chosen because they, you, each have the strong promise and potential to become globally competitive in your respective technology areas in the next decade. We have FY25 budget request included $4 billion for the Tech Hubs program, and we are hopeful that we will be able to continue to invest in all 31 of these Tech Hubs. We remain absolutely committed to all 31 tech hubs, and we are actively seeking ways to leverage additional capital into the hubs, build out our roster of benefits of designation, and continue to engage all 31 hubs in technical assistance through a community of practice and with senior official visits. We are also offering feedback sessions to all hubs on their phase two applications to ensure that they are stronger and more competitive in future rounds. We're extremely grateful to the hubs, our supporters in Congress, and our stakeholders in the economic development and national security communities for helping us to build out this critically important program. And I also want to extend my very deep gratitude to the members of the Tech Hubs team who have worked tirelessly to get us to this milestone. A year ago, the Tech Hubs team was one person, and now um, we have a full roster of incredibly committed, dedicated, and thoughtful people who have stood up this program and spent countless hours engaging directly with each of the hubs, and will continue to do so. And we're really, really thrilled to have each of them on the team. And with that, I will turn it over to their leader, Eric Smith, the Tech Hubs director, to offer a detailed update on the Tech Hubs program and um, uh, just as a reminder, we're going to be recording this session and it will be available in the future. So over to you, Eric. Thanks, Christina. And uh, as I'm pulling up the slides to share, um, let me echo um, the gratitude you expressed to all of you um, who have um, who are hubs, who have been involved in the in the program, who have uh, worked uh, tirelessly on your own behalf for this um, and for all the other supporters uh, and stakeholders out there who who follow and care about what um, we and you are doing through this program. Um, we will talk today um, about phase two and what we just announced uh, last week. Um, so um, from an agenda perspective, um, we will just overview the program again uh, briefly. Um, we'll again review phase one and some of those uh, outcomes specifically with respect to designation. Uh, we'll talk about the pipeline of, of phase two applications that we got, uh, which uh, across all 31 hubs were uh, really incredible. Um, a lot of, of great uh, indicators there. Um, and uh, phenomenal applications across the board. As Christina said, it was an extremely hard um, set of decisions to make. Um, and then we'll go through um, the, the implementation grantees um, and some of the aspects of those uh, particular hubs and, and funded projects. 
Um, we'll also talk about next steps um, for uh, all 31 hubs uh, and some of what we're doing in support uh, of, of everyone here. Um, so to overview the program, um, again, um, we're aiming to strengthen U.S. economic and national security, um, doing that by investing in places all throughout the United States um, of very different uh, characteristics, um, but with the potential to become globally competitive uh, in the next decade and, and doing that ultimately. So these technologies, the industries and the jobs of the future start, grow and stay here in the United States. Um, from a, where we are with the legislation, uh, authorization and appropriation perspective, um, again, authorized by the Chips and Science Act um, at the $10 billion level, uh, appropriated so far $541 million uh, across a couple of different appropriation acts. Um, just to, you know, that's a little bit over 5% of the authorized level. So uh, this is one of the indicators where, you know, we believe there's a, a lot of room for additional rounds of investment here, and, and we hope and expect to be able to do that. Um, and I just want to highlight some of the key statutory elements um, of that authorization. So the the statute and the way that it's multiple rounds of awards um, to uh, even within a given hub. Um, it also envisions initial awards of up to 150 million per hub. Obviously, at this funding level, that was that was that was too high, um, but um, that is the the vision of the statute. Um, and and also total awards uh, over the lifetime of the program of of up to a billion. Um, per hub. So um, at that fully authorized level, um, obviously a lot of headroom there for additional investments um, in the places and the hubs um, that are they're really making progress and really are on their way um, toward global competitiveness. It was a two phase competition. Um, so in the first phase, we designated 31 hubs um, out of about 200 applications for designation and uh, a little under 200 applications for strategy development grants. Um, you know, that's a that's an endorsement of the, the plan and capacity and potential um, to not just become globally competitive, but to be on an accelerated path to global competitiveness. Um, in addition to that endorsement, it also uh, provides access to the suite of benefits of designation. So we announced several of those uh, with phase one and a new package of benefits with phase two, which we'll talk more about uh, later in this presentation. Um, and then, of course, unlocks the opportunity to apply for implementation grants. Um, and that's that's true. Obviously, that was true with this first iteration of the program, um, but will also continue to be true in, in future iterations of the program. Um, you know, when we if we and when we get additional appropriations um, in phase two, um, that's for implementation funding. So the competition is really around um, the projects um, and kind of how to achieve global competitiveness and, and what can our funding do uh, to help hubs close gaps uh, primarily in these areas of uh, activities. We've talked about the consortium model a lot um, with respect to this program, but it, it really is a key element. And so I think worth highlighting again, um, you know, there is this this requirement in statute of the five different entity types, institutes of higher ed, uh, state, local, other subnational or tribal government, um, private sector, economic development organizations, and labor or workforce training organizations. Um, but there are a lot of other organizations that uh, can be consortium members and are consortium members across the 31 hubs. Um, so bringing that kind of inclusive and really well interconnected um, set of members together and, and showing that was a was a, a real key element of the program and continues to be um, that alignment around the shared strategic vision, um, the quality of those partnerships, 
um, and leadership within the hub, uh, both organizational leadership and that lead consortium member, and then also individual leadership um, in the regional innovation officer. Um, so to go back to kind of phase one and the outcomes there, um, again, the president announced uh, the 31 hubs um, in October of 2023. You can see those uh, on the map here. Um, the larger sized um, blue or blue and green dots representing the headquarters uh, of the designated hubs, um, 31 across uh, you know, many different technology focus areas uh, that we organized into eight themes, but really that each do have their own flavor. Um, and uh, I think there are some, some key elements to take away from um, the makeup of those consortia. Um, so those 31 hubs um, now uh, count more than 1,400 members. Um, so that's an average size of 44, um, so several dozen uh, on average per consortium. Um, those 1,400 consortium, mem consortium members uh, include more than 500 uh, private sector entities. Um, I think that's a really critical element and also a, a key success metric here that over a third of the organizations involved in these consortia are the private sector. Um, it really indicates the buy-in and participation um, in a program that ultimately aims to uh, accelerate um, the capacity of private sector firms to grow and scale uh, the production and delivery of technology and all of the kind of economic benefits that come alongside that, including new good jobs. Um, a couple other things to highlight here that, that nine of the 31 uh, include tribal governments in their consortia and that 17 partner with labor organizations. Um, and then you can also see here overlap with other federal programs um, with the Build Back Better Regional Challenge and an earlier EDA program, um, the NSF Engines program, uh, an ongoing program at uh, our partner agency, the National Science Foundation. Um, that overlap is, uh, you know, I think a strong signal that there are aligned federal investments and that hubs are really thoughtful about how they're aligning and stacking funding and other support um, for their programs. And so um, that really comes out um, in, in this and in, in other overlaps of, of federal funding and federal support um, and the 31 hubs. In phase two, uh, I do want to talk a little bit about the pipeline here. Um, so uh, across the 31 hubs, um, all 31 submitted applications. Um, those applications requested over $2 billion in EDA funding across over 180 different projects. Um, you can see the breakdown of, of projects here, but a, a good spread across those. Um, I also really want to highlight the commitments that the hubs were all able to secure in advance of their applications um, and and really in a, a relatively short period. Um, we know that you know four months is four months is a long time and is also not a remotely long enough time. Um, and I think the hubs did admirably in securing over 2,000 commitments in aggregate. Um, nearly a thousand of those were quantifiable investment commitments um, of si significant size. Um, you know, you could see several here. Um, you know, twenty-five million dollars uh, or above. And and again, that's just the quantifiable commitments. Um, that doesn't include the the over a thousand policy um, commitments or, or other non-quantifiable commitments that um, hubs were able to secure and, and really show. Uh, the buy-in of those regions. So another indicator that um, we had, you know, 31 excellent sets of projects uh, with a with a very difficult set of decisions. With respect to the difficult set of decisions, um, again in the implementation phase, um, phase two here um, on the right, we were focused on something a uh, slightly different set of evaluation criteria than in phase one. So in phase one, we were really looking for capacity and potential. Um, what is it about your place, um, your hub, your region um, that sets you up for um, the potential to become globally competitive in this time frame? In phase two, we were looking for how. 
Um, and so these evaluation criteria um, really look at how are the projects, how are related activities, how are is the are the organizations involved, how's the consortium itself um, going to achieve um, that global competitiveness? How are they going to leverage the potential of their region and their hub to become globally competitive uh, over the next decade? And now uh, on to the outcomes of phase two. So um, in phase two, um, we selected 12 of the hubs um, for 504 million um, in implementation awards. Um, you can see those 12 indicated here, um, notated with the stars um, on the map. Um, and those 12 really are spread out. Uh, you can see here uh, geographically very diverse. Um, and we'll talk about some of those characteristics um, later on um, about the geographic diversity, but um, also technologically diverse. Um, and I think to, to give a flavor here, um, we'll, we'll kind of run quickly through the 12 before we go on to um, the uh, more in-depth discussion of them in a bit, um, but you know, two in autonomous systems focusing on photonic sensing and on security and safety in autonomous systems, one in quantum um, focused on not just quantum broadly, but also the enabling technologies like uh, cryogenics and also some of the uh, current uh, kind of economically viable um quantum based products and for example quantum sensing um one in critical minerals looking at lithium um, and not just one element of that supply chain but the uh, kind of extraction to recovery and recycling the um, entire uh, loop as the hub puts it um you'll also uh we have kind of four focus on biotechnology um aligned with um kind of proportionally the 31 hubs overall, as this is a, a, a big strength of the US um, and also a focus area of a lot of innovation and commercialization. Um, so one focused on biofabrication, um, another on precision fermentation, another on pharmaceuticals and, and biologics manufacturing. And then in the precision and prediction space, um, personalized medicine, um, high resolution uh, imaging and, and leveraging that alongside um, data to, to make um, interventions uh, more tailored to the person. Looking at our energy transition, um, so two there, one on supply chain um, in clean energy and, and around grid resilience specifically. Um, another on uh, climate resilient infrastructure, uh, both making that infrastructure and the, the concrete specifically underlying it uh, stronger and more resilient, but also making that concrete uh, less carbon intensive. Um, on semiconductor manufacturing, focusing on um, the supply chain um, and how small and medium manufacturers in the region can be part of that supply chain. And then also sustainable plastics and rubbers transforming that industry um, and moving it away from fossil fuels. Um, so again, a lot of technology diversity, um, but kind of back to the nature of the hubs and some of the diversity there. So 10 of the 12 uh, serve small and rural communities um, and two are in the low population states. Um, nine will serve underserved communities um, you'll see uh, four include tribal governments um, five are in EPSCOR states uh, three include hbcus in the consortia themselves uh, nine include labor organizations um, so a lot of different characteristics of the different hubs it's not just the technology it's also about the places in which they are um, which again i think really shows the diversity across these and and all the hubs and and what the what different types of capacity what different types of potential um, for global competitiveness looks like and and how we can build those uh, build and accelerate the growth of these uh, vibrant economies all throughout the united states um, so I do want to talk a bit about um, some of the features of the most competitive applications. Um, and I'll you know repeat for those of you um, who are from hubs, 
um, on the line. Um, this is this is across uh, the entire portfolio. I think valuable insights at the aggregate level. Uh, we will be providing uh, individualized one-on-one -on -one feedback um, to each of the all 31 hubs. Um, you all have received some uh, outreach on that. We're working on that scheduling now, um, but we will dig in with you um, on feedback on particular applications so that, um, you know, for future rounds of this program and for other uh, potential sources of funding, um, you're you're able to incorporate um, those perspectives and, and that evaluation that, that we did do through this uh, process. Um, so we will go through these by the evaluation criteria. Um, so I think that's the kind of most effective way to do this. That was our our framework for decision making throughout the phase two process. Um, so um, just as a reminder from the earlier slide, um, these uh, the 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 seven evaluation criteria. The first three were weighted kind of each twice as heavily as the the latter four. Um, so we're going through these in that order. So these two um, and the first one on the next slide were the most highly weighted, the most significant um, evaluation criteria. So project quality, feasibility, and private sector integration. Applications that really stood out here um, had a uh, kind of real theory of the case about how all of the projects uh, complemented each other um, and how they all helped the hub um, make progress toward uh, realizing the overall kind of shared strategy and those challenges in the region. Um, you know, in addition to that strategic level, we were also looking at, again, feasibility. So what do the project plans look like? Um, are they realistic? Are they kind of showing that there is uh, the capacity of the organization leading um, or significantly contributing to any given component project? Um, showing that those organizations can, in fact, and have a history of delivering. Um, similarly, on the lead organization and the, the lead staff on these projects, making sure that there's a there's a track record of being able to deliver on these or, or other evidence showing um, confidence that um, the projects are feasible and are likely to be executed. Um, and then on the private sector side, as I mentioned before, the private sector is really critical here. Um, a lot of representation in the hub. Um, also want that representation to be um, really high quality um, and there to be really concrete participation. Um, and so showing how private sector entities uh, were not just supportive of the effort, but um, participating in the effort um, and what their role was. So whether that's as consortium members, as producers or consumers of technology, um, as employers, um, other clear roles like uh, providers of commitments, um, we we're really looking for for clarity around that. With respect to impact on economic and national security, um, this of course is you know that top line vision for us. This is what we want this program to achieve: strengthening both of those things. Um, so we wanted to understand. Um, why is this technology important? Um, what's the market for this technology now and what's it going to look like in the future? Um, and what are those opportunities? Why is the hub in a position to uh, take a, a portion of that market? Um, and how that's kind of tied back to the success of the hub. Um, so how does that how does uh, capturing some of that uh, current and future market in a particular technology and industry, um, how is that going to generate prosperity and growth across the hub, um, inclusively um, across communities within the hub um, and on that 10 year timeline? Um, and then also this alignment with national security priorities. So. Um, whether that was demonstrated um, as a specific use case for the warfighter, uh, whether that was about the geopolitical advantage of being a leader in a particular technology area, um, whether it was about resilience, um, you know, in the face of climate change or um, you know, supply chain resilience, uh, there are a lot of different um, a lot of different entry points into being relevant to national security. A lot of different ways to substantiate that. Um, across you know all, many many technology areas, and so we were looking for for that uh, in the application as well. On investment and policy commitments, um, this was again the third of the three kind of most highly weighted criteria. 
Um, and again, really strong across uh, the 31, as we talked about before. Um, for these, uh, the most successful applications um, showed kind of not just what the commitment was, but um, when they when those uh, commitments were going to be delivered, um, and how that the delivery, pardon me, the delivery of those commitments, um, and the the you know, impact of those commitments were aligned with the hub strategy and would support the projects that were being funded um, with EDA dollars. Um, also looking for you know, the why behind particular commitments. So uh, why was a particular source of capital? Why was a particular organization that was making a given commitment the right organization to do that? So, um, you know, again, not just sort of capturing the most um, commitments possible, but really being thoughtful and intentional about the alignment of a commitment with what the hub's trying to do. Um, focusing on you know, quality and likelihood of the delivery. Um, on the policy commitments, um, in particular, um, you know, addressing known challenges or leveraging clear opportunities, um, you know, overcoming regulatory barriers being an example, but really identifying what those, how those policy commitments were going to have an outsized impact. Um, and then, uh, you know, broadly for all the commitments, we were looking for um, the magnitude and significance of the commitment. Um, the relevance to the hub strategy, and then again, the, the likelihood that those commitments would be delivered. For developing, recruiting, and retaining talent and workforce, successful, uh, most competitive applications here um, demonstrated an understanding of the labor market, uh, the kind of challenges in the region with respect to the labor market, um, looking at supply and demand for particular skill sets. So, you know, we're looking at developing the workforces and growing the workforces in these regions. A, a clear understanding of the, the baseline was critical. Um, and then projects, initiatives that are uh, responsive to those challenges um, and the gaps in the workforce, um, and also that are, of course, aligned with employer uh, need. Ultimately, uh, employers need to be um, the ones hiring folks, employers need to be the ones um, that are ultimately executing the placements into jobs. Um, and so employers need to be um, informing and deeply engaged in um, the design of these projects and, and part of a continuous um, cycle of, of sharing information um, to inform these training programs of what those skill demands are and how that demand is changing over time. Um, since we are looking not at a single point in time, but really, you know, the growth trajectory of these hubs over several years and ultimately over several decades. Um, on capital formation, deployment and access, um, really a, kind of in some ways similar to the workforce uh, side here, understanding the current capital landscape, um, where do companies um, where do other organizations that need capital to execute their projects, where where can they access that capital um, in the region or otherwise, and, and, and what is that baseline? Um, and then similarly, identifying how to increase um, to access to capital and increase the, the way that capital is deployed in regions um, to help stimulate growth. Um, you know, this is true for uh, profit seeking companies and also for other entities in the region, um, really looking at capital broadly uh, to, to make sure that the various entities and the various efforts um, have what they need in order to grow. Private sector is a critical component, but not the only component by any means of these regions growing and scaling and, and growing and scaling um, is going to require investment uh, of some sort um, in order to, to make progress. On equity and diversity, um, really these two facets here, and these uh, both came through in the most competitive applications. Um, so uh, understanding the baseline and also having these really specific, proven, um, clear ways of reaching out to and bringing underserved communities and populations into the economic uh, activity, economic opportunity that these technology industries bring um, and bring them into the, the, the prosperity uh, that ultimately will result from the hub's growth. 
um, and and really understanding the best way to do that, given the populations and communities within the region, um, and there are various uh, needs and contexts. Um, but that's just the one facet. The other facet is also making sure that the leadership of the hub um, and the way that the hub and the component projects were governed and ran, ensuring that those were also inclusive of um, perspectives from those underserved and underrepresented populations and communities. Um, again, as a you know five years of projects and ten plus years of activity, hopefully you know going on spanning several decades of growth. Um, and a kind of continuing basis, um, ensuring that this isn't a single point in time engagement, but really building in um, these perspectives in the long run. And then lastly, speaking of leadership um, and governance, um, we also took a look at that. And so the most competitive applications here um, really articulated the governance framework, uh, made clear that um, made clear that the organizations leading the hub, um, had a framework for making decisions and navigating challenges, um, clear roles and responsibilities, and clear ways of, of making decisions, um, making sure that the regional innovation officer um, really had the experience um, necessary and a, a record of um, doing this work and leading across a number of different organizations um, and uh, bringing folks together around a single strategy, even if um, you know, those organizations might have different equities and contexts. Um, and then, you know, outlining that comprehensive strategy, really making sure that they really showed that they had been able to come together um, as a consortium and aligned around um, a particular concrete um, North Star um, for growth. Um, so on uh, next steps for all 31. Um, so um, throughout uh, the coming months, um, we're going to provide, um, again, one on one feedback um, to all of the hubs. Uh, this will be customized to the particular application and, and we'll have a session to talk through that. Um, we want to, again, make sure that everybody uh, understands kind of how we we're looking at the application and how we think that uh, different elements can be improved. Um, all all of the hubs, um, you know, are going to uh, work to seek additional capital for additional projects, whether that's right now or whether it's in the coming months and years. And so we want to we want to give that feedback to help um, you know improve that process. Um, but that's not the only support. Um, so through benefits of designation. Um, through our community of practice, um, through the site visits that we're going to uh, start very soon and, and will continue um, into the future in the coming years, um, we're going to continue to support the 31 hubs. Um, on the benefits of designation side, um, you can see here, um, you know, several, this is a summary, uh, more information on the website, of course, uh, but this summary here includes some of uh, the advantages. So, competitive advantage in the forthcoming Good Jobs Challenge competition from EDA. Um, similarly, uh, we announced in phase one um, a, a similar uh, competitive advantage in um, uh, for the Build to Scale program, which will also be coming out um, this summer. Um, obviously, you can see here a focus on access to capital and markets. Um, and one of the things I'll highlight here is a uh, the capital convening uh, that we are holding um, just now in uh, less than two weeks, uh, where we're bringing hubs together um, with uh, capital providers um, to help begin to build and strengthen relationships uh, among the two and identify potential other sources of funding for um, perhaps these projects, perhaps other things going on in the, in the region. Um, you know, we've also been focused um, on the national security aspect and not just the relevance of the technology, but also um, how to protect uh, the hubs and the entities within the hubs. And so, um, you know, one of our new benefits of designation um, with Department of Homeland Security is is focused on bringing some of the federal government's resources and services to bear in supporting the hubs on mitigating um, specifically cybersecurity and critical infrastructure security risks. 
Um, so in the remaining time, um, we'll quickly go through um, a little bit more in depth um, descriptions of uh, these uh, 12 hubs. Um, and they're organized here in terms of the kind of technology theme, although I think you'll see here and you'll see this actually across all 31 hubs. Um, the themes are a convenient organizing principle, but every hub really does have a uh, unique uh, technology focus, a really uh, compelling strategy, compelling set of assets and resources uh, related to that technology focus. Um, and so hopefully this gives a flavor of, of what that looks like, kind of a, a little more specific, another layer deeper at the hub level. Um, so Headwaters Hub, um, this is uh, located in Montana. Um, you can see the specific uh, geography here in the lower left, um, focused again on photonic sensing. Um, here, um, I'd say, you know, the theory of the case here is around uh, leveraging um, rough terrain, mountainous terrain, rivers, long uh, open highways, uh, a lot of different variety of places in which autonomous systems and uncrewed systems will operate. Um, that offers a phenomenal opportunity to test and demonstrate the sensors that will enable those uncrewed systems to, to navigate um, all different kinds of places and to understand kind of where they are in space and understand their contexts. Um, theta, uh, so also in autonomy, uh, but focused on the security and safety of uncrewed systems and primarily uncrewed aerial systems. Um, this is also looking at testing and demonstration, um, a really critical part of kind of technology readiness level six through nine and, and getting products into the market. Um, here, that uh, testing and demonstration, um, in addition with workforce and uh, you know focus on the software side of things as well and, and the AI center of excellence, uh, also includes an element focused on the certification um, and standard setting um, with respect to dr uh, drone uncrewed system security, um, just providing another axis of competitive advantage in addition to kind of manufacturing and, and demonstration. Looking at uh, Quantum in Colorado, um, the focus here, um, it, again, enabling a kind of rapid prototyping, low volume manufacturing, making sure that we can prove out these technologies um, and really a focus on kind of building the muscle memory for the quantum economy of the future um, by focusing on some of the enabling and nearer term technologies that are ready for the market now that have demand, uh, but building up again that industrial, that workforce uh, muscle memory for when um, the quantum economy grows and, and we have new technologies and, and new capabilities in the future. Um, one thing I'll mention here is that uh, as we provided for in, in NOFO's number one and two, so both of our funding opportunities, uh, while this hub is um, centered in and the formal geography is in and around the Denver area, um, it does include activities um, in New Mexico and particularly in and around Albuquerque and Sandia and Los Alamos National Labs. So of showing how you can um, build a hub and have those interconnections to, to other places as well. In Nevada, uh, again, focused on lithium and the full life cycle here, um, a really uh, clear theory of the case focused around workforce, uh, a lot of commercial activity in a number of different uh, parts and steps in the lithium supply chain uh, already happening in Nevada and in uh, northwestern Nevada, um, but uh, workforce being a challenge. And so, um, again, the focus here, um, but with service areas all throughout um, 16 of the 17 counties in the state of Nevada, um, really focused on um, laser focused on strengthening that workforce to, to take advantage of and to help fuel that commercial activity um, in that part of the state. Region Valley Tech Hub, um, this is located in New Hampshire um, and is focused on biofabrication. Um, again, building commercialization capacity, but I think two, um, two additional gaps that we're filling here with our funding that show some of the flexibility of, of the funding here. Um, and a real uh, shows kind of the, the hubs focus on what the particular problems are 
Um, one is a apprenticeship program in child care, um, noting that the child care and the, the, the lack of that or the dearth of that um, was a real barrier to um, filling jobs um, in this industry. So addressing that head on um, and then also addressing adoption head on uh, by making sure that practitioners, clinicians um, are uh, aware of these therapies, aware of the technology um, and aware of how to apply and what the advantages are to, to not only make sure that we can um, you know, produce these things, but also that they are ultimately delivered into patients. IFAB Tech Hub, located in uh, central Illinois. Um, here, uh, our funding is primarily going toward uh, building capacity and building specifically biofermentation capacity, um, acknowledging that uh, while we are um, at the forefront of uh, innovation in biotech and biopharmaceuticals and biomanufacturing in many ways, um, our capacity, particularly at certain scales, um, our capacity to actually do uh, the precision fermentation um, across the country um, has room to grow. Um, and so here, um, helping to build that biofermentation capacity at three different scales um, in, in this region. Harlan Bioworks, um, you know, building on a, a history of uh, pharmaceutical industry in this region, um, really um, a project that kind of hits a number of marks here, um, looking at workforce, how do we not just train folks, but how do we attract and connect them um, to this industry, making sure that we're supporting entrepreneurs in the space, um, and making sure that there's a place to do that, um, that where people can go, where uh, the facilities, equipment, training uh, equipment and, and services are, are all present um, in order to, to be able to most effectively uh, complement each other. In Wisconsin, uh, focused on um, theranostics, the conversion of diagnostics and therapies um, and, and shortening that loop, um, leveraging some uh, very high resolution uh, 3D imaging, um, specifically as applied to oncology, um, leveraging, uh, building out a data platform so that that imaging data can be linked with other health data in a secure and private way uh, to help uh, be more precise about treatments, um, and also um, deploying the screening technology um, as equitably and exclusive, inclusively as possible throughout the region uh, by making some of that screening technology and those screening, uh, the screening facilities mobile um, and deploying them throughout the state. Uh, South Carolina Nexus, uh, so this is focused uh, really on grid resilience in a couple of different ways, uh, making sure we have the ability to demonstrate battery production, uh, making sure we have facilities that uh, emulate real world grid environments so we can test compatibility, make sure that the various technologies can work in a real world grid, and then also uh, explicitly focusing on the cybersecurity of the grid, as I'm sure you've seen um, in in many uh, in the news lately. Um, our infrastructure, um, including our our electrical grid infrastructure, increasingly the target um, and victim of cybersecurity attacks. Um, and so making sure that we have um, the, the tactics and tools to uh, defend against those. Um, the South Florida Climate Ready Tech Hub, um, really, again, very focused on concrete and advanced concrete technologies, um, focusing both on the fact that uh, we need stronger concrete um, and better concrete in order to make sure that our coasts, our are prepared for um, the weather related uh, incidents that we are facing and increasing challenges due to climate change, but also making sure that the very carbon intensive concrete manufacturing industry um, is, is reducing its uh, carbon footprint. Um, so kind of both uh, attacking the, the cause and um, the results um, of some of the climate change challenges here. In New York, uh, upstate New York, focused on the semiconductor industry and here um, laser focused on supply chain. So making sure that um, the small and medium manufacturers in the region um, can be, are equipped to be, and ultimately do become part of the semiconductor supply chain. 
as these large scale fabs um, are uh, come online um, in this region. Um, really making sure that um, we're complementing other federal investments in the space um, and focusing on the needs of these small and medium manufacturers, whether that's their kind of innovation and uh, technology adoption needs or their workforce needs um, to, to help them uh, succeed. And then last, uh, but certainly not least, the Sustainable Polymer Hub, um, a, a historical um, polymer producing region, um, but one that has relied on uh, largely fossil fuel derived, petrochemical derived um, plastics and rubbers. Um, and so here investing in some specific critical path technology projects um, to help transition uh, and transition to uh, sustainable um, and more competitive um, polymer products, uh, polymer product manufacturing um, as this hub um, also grows. Um, so that's a quick summary of the 12 uh, sets of funded projects. Um, many of you are probably familiar with our uh, inbox and website, but if you do have questions, please do reach out to us. Um, the, the team is always ready and happy to respond. Um, we also have a, a new tranche of information on our website that we released uh, alongside uh, the phase two announcement. So um, if you haven't had an opportunity to, to dig into that, I um, encourage you to do that as well. Um, and our comps folks always, um, of course, uh, remind me to remind you all to sign up for our newsletter um, through which we provide a lot of updates um, and is one of the one of the best places to um, get information and up to date information about uh, EDA and our programs. Um, so let me conclude here by just saying thank you again. Um, we're we really appreciate the support. We appreciate all your work and we uh, those of you who are uh, part of the 31 hubs. We're um, looking forward to continuing to work with you uh, over the course of, of many years. Um, that's why we've got the tech ups team here um, and, and we're looking forward to that. And for those of you who are um, interested um, or supporters of the program or are curious, uh, thank you for being here today or, or watching this afterwards. Uh, we really appreciate the support of interest and uh, we're hopeful that we're able to execute additional rounds of the Tech Ups program. Thank you all.